Well, we have been in a series called Mythbusters, and we've been talking about these different things that we believe. Um, and oftentimes, as Christians, as followers, followers of Jesus, um, if we're not careful, we can pick up Christian myths. We can pick up things uh, that we begin to believe in our life that aren't necessarily rooted in Scripture. And sometimes you and I have encounters and experiences with God uh, that are that are that are our experience. It's our encounter with God, and it's meant for us, and it's valid, and it's real, but it's not necessarily normative. And over time, what we've seen happen in the body of Christ is that is that sometimes people can take those normative experiences, or they can take those exceptional experiences, and they can put those exceptional experiences on other people as if, they, as if those experiences are normative. And so we've been talking about those things. We've also been talking about things that some of, us, some of us have come to believe in our life because scripture's been taken out of context or it's been twisted or, or perhaps it just comes from our own personal culture or belief. And as we've been debunking these myths, we've learned a lot together. A myth is a common, excuse me, a wildly held but false belief or idea. We've talked about that over and over over the last several years. And sometimes we get... Uh, we get confused about, about myths because we have our own cultural biases. We have our own personal experiences. And, and, and our belief about the world and certainly the culture of the kingdom of God that we pass on to other people sometimes can become very clouded and confused. We're not going to go through all of the myths that we've covered in this series, but if you're curious about this, you can always go to our YouTube channel or you can go uh, to our website. You can download the audio, and it is because of YouTube and the video that I took all of that off because this will live forever online and um, <laughs> will not have the context of this holiday. So we talked, about, uh, we talked about the will of God last week, and I don't know about you, but for me, that was a very freeing message. Uh, it's, it's very freeing to learn the difference uh, between uh, between the will of God and how it works in my life, and there's certainly been times in my life where I've sinned or I've, or I've stepped away from what I know is God's best, or other people have done things in my life, and I thought, this can't possibly be, be the will of God. We have to have an understanding of the will of God, of his sovereignty that allows us to stay confident and sure in spite of what happens in our life. Well, I want to move on this week as, we, as we're thinking uh, about different myths that we embrace as Christians, and I want to talk about. I want to talk specifically about. Um, if, if you remember last week, uh, Paul was talking about anxiety, and he talked. If you go all the way back to when we were talking about demons and spirits, one of the things that gets us caught up in some of these myths are fears and anxieties that we have. And um, as I was reflecting on where I was from and. And I actually, I had some camouflage pants that I was going to wear uh, with all this get up today uh, because camo is a big player where I'm from and uh, not just ironically for real, that's how people dress, uh, but, but I decided not to wear them. And I was thinking about camouflage and I was thinking about uh, all of that. And I don't know what your home culture is and I'm, I apologize if this uh, offends you, but in my culture where I'm from, uh, people, people go out and they hunt and hunting's a big part of of our culture. And again, if that offends you, I'm sorry. It's just, that's my culture. And I, at one time I was out hunting, um, with my dad when I was, uh, when I was a pretty young kid, I was probably, probably in my early teens. And I remember he had taken me out, um, early in the morning. And if you're not familiar with the way that it works, we were, we were hunting, uh, deer and he took me out to the blind early in the morning before the sun came up and uh, left me there, and then he was going to go to another uh, another blind, and and I was kind of waiting there and waiting for uh, the sun to come up and all, all of the thing, and listening closely for any animals or any movement. And uh, as the sun was coming up, it was just kind of an eerie feeling uh, as I sat there and as I just waited for a, a really long period of time. And then then the sun came up, and usually the way at least we did it. Uh, you, would, you would go out and you would hunt in the morning and the sun would come up. It would come mid-morning. You'd go back in because the animals stopped moving around. And then you'd, you'd come back out later in the day. Well, the sun came up. The morning kept going on and on and on. And my dad never came back. And uh, he never came back and never came back. 
And then I heard a loud bang off in the distance. Well, obviously, if you know anything uh, about hunting, it was, it was a gunshot off in the distance. But I was a pretty little kid. I'd been sitting there for a very, very long time. And uh, then nothing happened. Usually after something like that would happen, you would start to hear movement and uh, track the animal, all those things. But I sat there and I sat there and I sat there and nothing happened and nothing happened and nothing happened. I'm one of these people who have a little bit of an imagination. Okay, I have a lot of imagination. And I was just sitting there and waiting and waiting and waiting. It was probably not very long, but for me, it felt like a really long time. I told you guys before, I grew up, my parents became Christians right around the time that I was born, and I was raised in a very traditional uh, Pentecostal church, very hellfire and brimstone, and uh, if they were going to get you to the altar and get you saved one way or another, that was just the way that it was. And one of the ways uh, that that they got you saved is they talked a lot about the second coming of Jesus and the rapture taking place. And you didn't want to be left behind. They were going to get hell out of you one way or another. If they had to scare it, they were going to get it out of you one way or another. Right? And I remember, and all of this, after sitting there so long, and I said so bored, my little imagination just started running. And we lived probably, I don't know, or where we were at was a few hundred kilometers, if that far from an Air Force base. And uh, so what that meant was that fighter jets, would they would train in that area. So fighter jets would fly by. So I'm sitting there, long time. Dad's never coming back. He's never coming back. He's never coming back. Loud explosion, no movement, nothing's happening. All of a sudden, fighter jets flew over. Again, I wasn't thinking about the fact there's... I'm just thinking about, wait a minute, what if, what if World War III has started and we all know that that the rapture is going to take place, then there's going to be World War, we know that, right? And I'm sitting there and my dad's not coming and my dad's not, and I'm like, Oh, I have been left behind. <laughs> Please tell me I'm not the only person in this room that has said, come on, I need to see some hands. I need some support. And I'm telling you, I'm sitting there, and it goes on, and I'm running the scenario in my mind. Oh, man, I've been left behind. What am I going to do? And I'm playing through this, and I work myself into a total frenzy. Uh, because I just feel like I have been... How many of you have ever called a family member and they didn't answer and they were that one family member you knew was going to heaven and you thought, if they're not answering the rapture... (laughs) Yep, it was one of those moments. It was one of those moments. How many of you have that one family member who never answers the phone so you can't count on them to know when the rapture takes... Yeah, anyways, that's another sermon. Um, I was so caught up in that fear and that anxiety, and it, it, was a, it was a childhood trauma, there's no doubt in my mind. And at, at the time, I was so excited uh, when my, I heard the, the quad coming up later and my dad picked me up. I did, I, it took me a long time to ever tell anyone this story because I was so embarrassed. But I was so relieved when my dad came and got me. And later in life, reflecting on that moment, I've thought to myself many times, wow, how... How terrible, how terrible that theology was that created a moment in my life where I experienced that much fear, where I experienced that much anxiety. Because the more and more that I learn about God and the more and more that I learn about Scripture and the more and more that I learn about the nature of God, what I experienced in that blind that day was the opposite of what relationship with God is supposed to be about. What I understand about Scripture and the identity of God is that's not at all who He is. In fact, in fact, who He is, what it means to be in relationship with Him, means to break that hold of fear and anxiety in our lives. I want to I read to you, or let me say this, disrupting a myth 
This has probably happened to all of us this, this month during the series. Disrupting a myth creates freedom, but it also creates or causes some instability in your lives. Maybe, maybe you don't want to raise your hand. Maybe you don't want to meet this, uh, admit this. But how many of you, perhaps during this series, I've touched on some issues or I talked about some issues that perhaps challenged some of the things that you believed about God? And in those moments, did it not cause you to think, well, if, well, if that's not true, then what else have I believed that's, that's true that's not true? And what does that mean about my life, my relationship with God, my relationship with family? Whenever you begin to debunk myths in your life, especially Christian myths or theological myths, it causes some instability. However, on the other side of that instability is a freedom. There certainly is a freedom that exists in my life and my walk with Jesus today. I'm not that same scared little boy that I was in that, in that deer blind because I know God. I have a relationship with him. I, I'm not scared of him anymore. I'm not scared of missing heaven. I'm not scared of missing out. I'm not scared that every time I make a mistake that my father is going to reject me. Hello? What kind of relationship with that? What kind of father would that be if every time I made a mistake or if I said something the wrong way or if I made the wrong move in my life that all of a sudden my father would say, no, you're not my son anymore. You have no part in my kingdom anymore. And as I've grown and as I've matured and I've come to understand God, that's not my relationship with him. I'm not bound in fear. I'm not bound in anxiety. Listen. When we begin to deal with myths in our life, it will deal with our value system. But on the other side of that, if we allow Scripture to guide us and if we allow Scripture to lead us, it's going to cause us to become stronger and more free than we've ever been before. So here's uh, the myth that I want to deal with today. Because I believe that some of us, it may sound silly, some of you were perhaps not raised this way and you, you perhaps have never felt this way. But I believe there's enough of us in this room who've dealt with this fear, this myth. What if I, what if I missed the rapture? What if, I, what if somehow I fell God and I'm forgotten? Has God forgotten me? Has God left me out or left me behind? I want us to read from Matthew chapter 6 verses 33 and 34. It says this, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own troubles. Sufficient for the day is its own troubles. Troubles. We've, we've taught you here at North Place that a great place for you to study your Bible and for you to read in your Bible is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. That's the, the sermon on, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. It's where Jesus really lays out his theology, he kind of introduces his kingdom and says, hey, this is my kingdom, this is what it looks like, this is what it means to be in my kingdom. And, and throughout that entire sermon, he's comparing what the people who were listening to him thought and believed about the kingdom of God and what it actually means to live in the kingdom of God. And so I would encourage you during your daily 20 this week, read Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. You can, during that five minutes of reading, you can easily read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And as you, as you do that, listen closely to how Jesus is comparing the kingdom of God Versus how you, what you and I believe about the kingdom of God. Here was the problem. Those people who were listening to Jesus teach, they had an idea and a concept of what it meant to be in the kingdom of God. In many ways, Jesus was myth busting for them what it meant to be in the kingdom. And as you come to the end of chapter 6, Jesus says to them, listen, seek first the kingdom, the antidote, the antidote for your anxiety, for your fear, is to seek, seek the kingdom of God. And in particular, he was comparing the relationship that one had with God in the kingdom versus the relationship that one thought they had if they were outside of the kingdom. Jesus says this, listen, the object of our pursuit determines the sureness of our steps. The object of our pursuit determines the sureness of our steps. If you, if you are like me and th your relationship with God is one that was based on fear 
If your relationship with God was based on an understanding of him, that he was up in heaven ready to judge you, ready to deal with you, ready, ready to react to every, to, to be triggered by every little mistake you make, perhaps, may I encourage you to consider today, perhaps you, you, you don't really know him. And perhaps you don't really understand his kingdom. Those people who were there that day, who were gathered there, they thought they knew the kingdom of God. And so when you get into Matthew chapter 6, Jesus uses a few examples. He says, listen, one example, one of the things that would have been really big to a first century Jewish person is uh, according to their religion, if you were really a godly person, then you had to give to the poor. And so one of the ways that they measured how spiritual you were was by how much you gave. How well you gave. And it became so entrenched in their culture that they were like, oh, I'm going to show, let me show you how much I'm in the kingdom, how godly I am. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give more than you. I want to make sure you all see how much I give. So Jesus, Jesus said, hang on, you guys, you don't, you don't understand this. You're thinking that you give to prove the kingdom. You think that you give to prove that you're godly. Jesus said, listen, you've got it entirely backwards. Jesus also, also talked about prayer. He talked about fasting because, again, these would have been things that religious people would have done to get access into the kingdom. This is how they would have proven that they were religious or that they were godly. They would have prayed really loudly and they would have used just the right words. And so everyone would have known how spiritual they were based on the words that they prayed or how they prayed. And then you know, and that we love this one also. Jesus said, guys, what is the deal with this fasting thing? What are you doing? You've got it. You are fasting, and instead of it really being about God and relationship with God, you're not taking a bath for several days. You're not putting on... This is first century, like people needed to put on some perfume, guys. You're walking around all haggard. So because you want everyone to know that you're fasting. It's January. We have to fast in January. That's what it's in the Bible somewhere, although it's not, but it is. But let me write a book about it. Then let me hold the church and make them do it. Because if you don't do it, then God won't bless you. My year is going to be ruined because I practice, I practice Christian witchcraft and I think if I don't do these things, then all of a sudden, all year long in 2025, God's going to be like checking the roll. Oh, wait, Randy didn't fast in January. Nope, we can't answer that prayer this year. Oh, Jesus, I know you died on the cross Jesus, I know you were stripped naked. I know that you were beaten. I know that you went through all of that stuff. But Randy didn't fast January 15. So I think we're not going to listen to him this time. Jesus, your, your work on the cross wasn't enough. We needed Randy to add that little extra to get it over the top. my wig back. <laughs> See, when, when I'm pursuing the wrong thing, my, my steps become unsure. Then I'm playing this game. I'm not fasting. I'm not fasting in intimacy with the Father. I'm not fasting to deal with my... I'm fasting to impress people, including God. I'm fasting to try to get Him to move His hand. I'm fasting to try to get His blessing... When he's already, he's already said the yay and amen in Christ Jesus, but I'm somehow trying to convince him. Here's the thing. Bad theology convinces us to measure eternal truth through temporal filters. You go, go read Matthew chapter 6 this week. I, I can't go through the whole thing, but this is what we do. This is what myths, this is what Christian witchcraft, this is what myths do. It measures an eternal God and his word that he's already spoken his work that he's already accomplished, the victory that he's already won, it somehow measures Jesus' victory by my experience, by my moment. 
Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21 says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy or where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither the moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, for where your treasure is, then your heart's going to be also. I'm just curious, is it possible that you and I are having the exact spiritual experience that we're reaping the exact kingdom that we're sowing into? Is it possible that in our religious activity, in the things that we believe, in our, in our practices that lower the fullness and completeness of the work of Christ, in our insistence in putting it on us, on our ability to do the right things, say the right things, behave the right way. Is it, is, is it possible that you and I are reaping the exact kingdom that we're sowing into? Jesus said, guys, you're, you, you, believe that it's about, you believe that it's about giving and everybody's seeing that you're giving. Well, you know what? If you're giving and everybody's seeing that you're giving and they're applauding you, then you're, you're getting your reward right now. Don't worry about it. If you're praying and, and the, you're praying so other people can see you pray and so other people know you pray the right way, then you're getting the, you're getting the exact answer that you're looking for. If you're, if you're fasting and you're doing all of these things to get the, you get, you're getting, Jesus said, listen, here's another way. Sow into a kingdom that is eternal. Sow into a kingdom that is beyond this. And, and get this, this kingdom doesn't change as a result of your current experience. See, here's, here's a, a, such a problem with our, our current mythology that we live in in Christianity is somehow, I don't know how, but we've just decided to ignore Jesus and to ignore the disciples and to ignore the New Testament altogether. And we've created a theology that says, oh, oh if I'm doing it right, then everything's going to be good in my life. Which is the exact opposite of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Jesus said, listen, your problems are going to happen. Being in my kingdom doesn't mean that there's not going to be a battle or a war in this kingdom. But people who are in my kingdom, their hope, their confidence, their trust isn't shaken by what happens in this life. You're measuring the kingdom of God. You've lowered the standard of the kingdom of God to your bank account on this earth. Oh, well, if, if I give in the offering, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get blessed. Really, is, that, is it that shallow? Is the kingdom of God, is the eternal kingdom of God so shallow that it's measured by the shoes that you wear, the clothes on your back, the food that you have in this life? Jesus said, if that's how you understand the kingdom, if that's the kingdom you want to pursue, go for it. But that's not my kingdom. My kingdom is transcendent of all of this. And when you sow, when you give, when you pray, when you fast, stop looking for results in this kingdom. Because the blessing of my kingdom is beyond this life, this earth. Matthew chapter 6, um, verse 24 Jesus said this, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will, be devoted to the, uh, he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. I've uh, read this many, many times, heard it preached at me many, many times and it, it's pretty straightforward. You can't serve you can't serve God in money. And on the surface, we look at it and we say, and then we, like, we get up and we, we preach this very anti-commercialism, uh, anti anti-capitalism, anti-money religion. And we think that's the point. And we use that to bash people. But if you read the whole passage, in fact, if you read the old episode when Jesus is teaching the Sermon on the Mount and you understand it in context, the point of what Jesus was saying, really what he was saying was an illustration for the broader point that he was having. He was comparing the kingdom of God against the kingdom of Satan. And in their mind, in that place, in that time, the way they measured power was money. Does that sound familiar at all? The way they measured 
The way they measured effectiveness was money. The way they measured success was money, even spiritual success. Imagine, I know it's really hard to imagine. We can't imagine this at all. But imagine a religion that said, oh, they're blessed because you can tell by what they wear. Oh, you can tell if they're blessed because, uh, you know, look how much they give or, or, or look how what they have or look what, uh, look what, you know, look at their animals or their, imagine that. I mean, I know we can't imagine that very much. Uh, Texas people, you guys don't even, like, you have that problem. We don't have prosperity preachers or anything here in Southern Africa. And we don't have Christianity. I know you guys have that stuff in Houston going on, all that stuff. You know, it's a problem for y'all, not us. Imagine, imagine lowering the identity of God to a, the measuring stick of man. And we've learned it here together, and we learn it all the time here at North Place. Really, so much of this is about power, and it's about control. And Jesus, as he was, he was making this, he was saying, look, you've got, you got to choose. you got to choose which kingdom you're in here. And you can't conflate my kingdom or measure my kingdom by how you measure your kingdom. And the the problem is, is that you and I are measuring our kingdom by God's kingdom. And we look around and we say, oh, I don't have the car that so-and-so has. I don't have the bank account that so-and-so has. I don't have the job. that so So I must be being left out. God must not be blessing me. Again, you don't have to feel like, you don't have to raise your hand. But how many of us have ever felt left out of the kingdom through measuring, through measuring what's happening in somebody else's life? How many of us have applied the standards of the world, the measuring stick of mammon, the measuring stick of the world, of power and control to the kingdom of God? And then we get mad at God. Then we get our feelings hurt, and then we become upset. And even more, we become gripped with anxiety and fear. And we say, God must not, I'm left out. God must not love me. He must not care about me. Or what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? Why did did I miss the rapture? That's what I was thinking as A a young teenage boy, what did I do? I'm going through it in my mind, right? Some of you said, yeah, I had that experience. Oh, I didn't, oh, I didn't ask for forgiveness of that one time. By then, trust me, I had already asked forgiveness about Chuck E. Cheese. That was done. It was other stuff. There was other stuff besides stealing the coins at Chuck E. Cheese. And I'm sitting there like, God, what? Oh, I didn't do this. I should have said this. I didn't. I'm going through my mind and what torment, what torture. I look around other people. And that that moment, I'm so grateful my dad came and I didn't have to uh, I didn't have to rip off my sleeves and tie a band on my head and go through the woods and kill my own food and survive. I had a plan, guys. I had a plan. I didn't have to execute plan Z that day, but that that fear. That belief about God, that belief about myself, that, that way of measuring the kingdom of God against, against the way my world celebrates success, it marked my life. And I started, I started, this is good, I started recreating God in my image. I started measuring God against me. You know, I don't, I don't know who you are today, and I don't, I don't really know how you came to this service. I don't know all of your theology. I don't know all of the things that you believe about yourself or you believe about God. But I have, I have good news for you. God was not created. He does not exist in your image. His love is perfect and it's complete. His love is not, get this, his love is not in any way affected by my failure. He, and this is what's so beautiful about the kingdom of God. See, in the kingdom of man, you are are what you've done. You get your grades in matric based on your performance of your exam. 
Come on, matric parents, I know you're like, that was your place to say amen. (laughs) We get our paycheck at work based on what we've done. Our bonus is built on our performance. For many of us, for many of us who have unhealthy marriages, our marriages are based on what we've done. Did she cook the biryani just the way I like it? (laughs) Did he take out the trash? Did she greet me when I walked in the room? Hello? Uh, Am I getting just too close to where we're living? And our relationship is based on that level of performance. That's how the world works. That's how the kingdom of this world works. You are, you are what you've done. In the kingdom of God, friend, the the news, the good news for you and I is it's not based on what we've done. It's based on what Jesus has done. And because of his perfect work for you and I, the father has said, I will, Randy, I will receive you. I'll receive you. Now, does that mean that, does that mean that I never give? No, it just means that when I, my give, when I give, my right hand doesn't have to know what my left hand's doing because I'm not measuring it anymore. Because my giving, there's no account. There's no exchange system. There's nothing to exchange. I don't give to get. I give I give because I love. I give because he loved me. I give because my nature is now, get this, generous. I I am in abundance. Your bank account may not say that. That's okay. My eternal bank account does. It does. My inheritance, oh, you have no idea. How can you give that all away? I mean, I'm not counting. I don't have to. I don't care if you know how I pray. I don't care if you know how much I pray. I may sound completely ridiculous to you when I pray. I I have a relationship with my father. There's an intimacy there. It's not a performance. It's not a performance. In fact, my prayer life is not about convincing God. It's about convincing my flesh to come into alignment with what my God has already said. My fasting, it's not to move God. It's to crucify my flesh. It's to clean out those, it's to shut those windows and clean out those rooms and to replace them with something else that we talked about a few weeks ago. Some of us have lived for years with fear but here's the kingdom of God God's not asking you to perform he's just asking you to be he's just asking you to be and here's what I promise you some of you are going to hear this series you're going to hear me today and I love you and I want to say this with as much grace you're going to reject what I'm preaching today you're more drawn to a religion and a belief system of performance because that is the kingdom of this age. Some of you are, some of us are gonna, we're not gonna, we're not gonna push deeper into scripture to learn what scripture says for itself. We're just gonna keep looking at the Bible to validate what we want and what we believe. The Bible actually talks about it. People will gather preachers and teachers who tell us what we wanna hear because we have itching ears because guess what? We are the sons and daughters of Satan in our flesh. That's our kingdom. Some of us are going to stay in that place because we're more comfortable in that place. We're happier in that place. But some of us are sick and tired. We're sick and tired of being alone and afraid and anxious and overwhelmed. We're tired of living in that instability and that insecurity. And for those of us who know that's not who I am, that's not my identity, that's not where I want to live, the good news for you today is God looks at you and he's not asking you for anything. He's just saying, 
He's just saying, I want relationship with you. I want you in my kingdom. There's room for you at this table. And if that's you and you're here today, I, you may be, you may have joined a church, you may have been sprinkled in water at some point in your life. You may, that's not what we're talking about talking about intimacy with your creator God who asks nothing of you, who says come embrace my kingdom exchange exchange kingdom of this world where you gotta work and make it happen exchange that for this free gift of life and salvation that will fulfill you that will give you hope that will give you peace that's the gospel that's the good news and for those of you Perhaps you are a Christian, you're a believer today, but your theology has built a, a wall between you and God where you le- live from anxiety to anxiety, from fear to fear, from performance to performance. I invite you, just as Jesus invited those people on that day, I invite you to lay down your performance version of Christianity and to embrace what it means to be a son and a daughter who just is in the kingdom.